Join our WhatsApp group to get daily latest updates. It's totally free. Part 1 You will hear a man phoning a real estate agent in order to rent out rooms in his house. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 7. Hi, Bellingham Real Estate Agents. Could you hold, please? Okay. Sorry about that. What can I do for you? Yeah, I'm looking for some tenants for my house, and I was hoping you could advertise it for me. Sure, no problem. Is it here in Vancouver? No, it's just outside in Richmond. Very nice. It's a house, you say? Yes, it's a family house. It's two-story, quite modern. Right. And you're wanting to rent out the whole place, is that right? No, no. Just two rooms are for rent. That's two bedrooms plus the use of the rest of the house. It would really suit a couple of students. Okay. Can you just tell me the address, please? Yeah, sure. It's 3281 Number 1 Road, Richmond. Okay. That's quite a way out. And how much were you thinking of for these rooms? I thought $700 per room would be a pretty fair price. Is that per month? Sure. Okay. You'd get at least a 1000 if you were in Vancouver. Yeah, I know. Hmm. Any other costs? Uh, just the cleaner who comes once a week. Cleaner, okay. And how much would your tenant have to pay her? Um... Actually, it's a guy, and uh, that would be another $30 a month for the cleaning. Okay. And is it nice? I mean, is it got a view and things? Sure. It looks out over the ocean. No garden, but there's lots to look at from the lounge. Okay, and your name is? Peter Trubois. Trubois. Is that B-O-Y-S? No, it's... T-R-U-B-O-I-S-E. True boys. Nice name. And your address? It's the same one I just gave you. Fine, as above. Got a phone number you can give me? Sure. I'm calling you from it. It's 6047-4106. And a cell? Yes, that's 903-277-3987. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 8 to 10. Now, let's get down to the serious stuff. What have you got in the kitchen? A fridge, of course. Yes, a fridge. And there's a dishwasher. Got facilities for washing clothes? Yeah, a washing machine in the basement and a dryer, too. Okay. Gas or electric stove? Electric. And in the kitchen there's a microwave as well. Fine. Now what about the house? Anything worth mentioning? Sure. There's a room for playing ping pong and pool. Great. And how's it heated? It's got central heating, but no fireplace. That's too bad. I like an open fire in winter. Air conditioned? No. No conditioning. I suppose you've got a TV. Sure. Cable? Uh, afraid not. I've never gotten around to putting it in. Fine. What sort of tenant are you looking for? Students, you said? That's right. Although it's quite away from the university. 
I guess they'd need a car. That's true. Still, there's a shopping mall just a block away. I'm looking at a map right now. Yep, just a small one. No movie theaters or anything like that. We're right by the beach, though, and that's something. Sure, especially in this weather. I wish I was there myself. Any other entertainment in the area? There's a cocktail lounge on the corner and a couple of hamburger joints. You'd have to go downtown for a movie, though. Oh, and Boyd Park is only a couple of hundred yards away. Okay, Mr. Trueboys, I'll post this up for you, and I hope you have some luck. Thanks. Bye. Bye, and take care. Sure, thanks. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a talk on an organization called Worldwide Student Project. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Hi everyone, my name's Sam Thomas, and I'm here to give you some information about Worldwide Student Projects, or WSP for short. The talk takes about five minutes, and after that I'll be happy to answer questions, OK? Right, well, WSP is a voluntary service organisation which was set up to promote international understanding. Right now we've got people from 30 different countries working in local communities around the world. So if you're interested in joining them, I'd like to tell you about some of the opportunities that are available. Now, depending on how long you want to be away, there are three sorts of projects to choose from. Short-term projects lasting two to three weeks, medium-term projects lasting between one and six months, and long-term projects which can be anything up to a year. One of the short-term ones we've got on offer at the moment is in Japan. It's a village improvement project, and the work involves clearing the river banks and planting flowers, things like that. You'd be working alongside local people, so you need a basic knowledge of Japanese for that. The next one to tell you about is a children's holiday centre in Poland. What's required here is basically manual work. You'll be painting rooms, gardening and generally preparing for the children's arrival. It's a medium-term project lasting six weeks, and there's comfortable accommodation on site. And now something for the animal lovers amongst you. It's a conservation project for sea turtles in Mexico. Sea turtles are under threat from poachers in that part of the world, so your main job would be collecting and moving the eggs to a safe site. It's a short-term project and you'd be staying in a local school, but be aware that it has very basic conditions. Don't expect any luxury of satellite TV. Now here's an exciting opportunity in China for any budding architects. This is a long-term project, and placements are for nine months. You'd be working in an office in Shanghai, involved in planning and design, under supervision of a local architect. Oh, and I should mention, that you have to pay an additional fee of 250 US dollars when you arrive. Finally, do we have any medical students here? Because there's a placement available in a center for disabled children in India. You'd be providing general medical care and also assisting in the outpatients of department. It's for six months, so you can get plenty of experience and also do something worthwhile for disabled children. Before you hear the rest of the talk, 
You have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen carefully and answer questions 18 to 20. Well, that's just a taste of the incredible range of projects we have to offer. But I hope it's whetted your appetite. And in case you do decide to apply, let me tell you what happens next. First of all, you need to fill in an application form and send it to us. Oh, and you should also include a passport photo, by the way. Once we've received the form and photo, we process them and then we send you a welcome pack containing general information about the program, together with the formal terms and conditions. These terms and conditions are basically a list of responsibilities on both sides, yours and ours. What happens if you want to leave early, etc. And you also get a detailed questionnaire, which helps us identify a suitable job for you. Then about one month before you leave, you'll receive all the details about your particular placement. And I think that's about it. Oh, I never forgot to mention. We've also got a website. The address is in our brochure. Now are there any questions? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between two students. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 30. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 30. Decided what you're going to join yet, Sarah? Well, I want to do something connected with media and journalism, but there's such a lot to choose from. Isn't there? Let's look at all the information we've got and we can decide what we want to do later. Right. Let's see. There's something here called Grapevine. What is it? It's a student magazine. Apparently, it won Magazine of the Year at The Guardian and NUS. I guess that's the National Union of Students Media Awards in 1995. That sounds good. Do they want people to work on it? Oh, yes. They want lots of people. It says here they need people to write features, sell advertising, and to proofread articles. Oh, and to take photographs. That's a possibility. I like the idea of taking photographs. Do you? I think I'd like to write articles, but I'm not sure. What have you got there? Concrete. It's a newspaper. It sounds very professional. What makes you say that? Well, it's 48 pages long, for a start. That's bigger than some national newspapers. I suppose it is. What else does it say? Let's see. It did well at last year's Media Awards, too. And it says it has lots of different sections, as well as news like features, sport and entertainment. That might be good experience. What do they need people for? They want people to edit and organise. I wonder what they mean by organise. Yes, it does sound a bit vague. Well, it's obviously well organised. It started in 1992 and it's still going strong. Mm, sounds possible. Yeah, but let's go on, shall we? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions
Here's something a bit different. Live Wire. It's a student radio station. Now that does sound interesting. What type of programs do they produce? It just says good quality and entertaining programs. What are they looking for? Again, there aren't a lot of details. It says they want people to work in all areas of radio broadcasting. I think I'd like to find out more about that one. Hmm. So would I. We'll come back to it later. Oh, look at this! Do you fancy being on television? Don't tell me there's a student TV station as well. Yes, there is. It's called Nexus UTV. They produce a wide range of programs, and they have a production deal with the BBC. That sounds really interesting. Is it difficult to get into? I don't know. I don't think so. They want a lot of people, actors. I used to act in school plays when I was about ten years old. Well, maybe acting isn't for you. But they also need people to direct programs, to read the news, and to be comedians. I could see you as a comedian. <laughs> Should we go for that then? Maybe. Let's look at what else there is. I think there are two more. Yeah, something called Notice Board, whatever that is, and Student Web. What's Notice Board about? Well, it's a magazine with lots of local information. Hmm, doesn't sound all that exciting. Well, if you change your mind, they want people to write articles and to produce the magazine. I don't think so. Let's look at Student Web. Okay. Well, we've had the radio station and the television station, so I suppose we have to have the website. It's quite a big website. Look, there are a thousand pages. What sort of things are on it? Well, there's information about shops and entertainment, but there are also features and a news service. They want people to write websites. Writing websites sound a bit too technical for me. Ah,、uh, but they also need people to do some graphics and to write articles. I still don't think that's for me. What about you? No, it doesn't really interest me either. I like the sound of Grapevine, Livewire, and Nexus UTV. Yeah, those are the three I'd choose. But we're only going to have enough time to join one club, so let's go back and look at the information on those three again. Okay, first. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecture about tourism. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Travel and tourism is the largest industry in the world, but calculating its economic impact is quite difficult. The one thing everybody can agree on, though, is that it's huge. There are two things which have influenced the growth of tourism. There are firstly social factors, and secondly technology and the way it's developed. Let's consider the social factors first of all. Demand for tourism is determined mainly by the amount of wealth a country has, which is why countries such as Japan, Australia, the USA, and Western European countries have contributed most in terms of tourist numbers in the past. However, growing wealth in developing countries will mean that demand for holidays abroad will take off there in the near future, boosting tourism enormously. That said, the majority of tourists are still from what are called the developed nations. However, studies show that their number will not rise much further in the next few decades, because their populations are fairly stable. As a result, there'll be a growth in the number of retired people who will have more time on their hands. This will influence the kind of tourism wanted. 
fewer skiing holidays will be required, but there'll be an increase in the number of people wanting to visit art galleries. Let's turn now to the second factor in the growth of tourism. The technology that sustains mass tourism today is the jet plane. Air travel has opened up the world. In 1970, scheduled planes carried 307 million passengers. Today, there are four times as many. In fact, cheaper and more efficient transport have been behind the development of mass tourism from its beginnings in Britain in the 19th century. The first package tours were arranged in 1841 by Thomas Cook, an entrepreneur whose company subsequently became one of the world's largest tour operators. In his day, it was the railway that allowed his business to flourish. Today, technology is proving important in other ways as well as in transportation. In the past, people went to a travel agent to find and book their holiday. Now many of these people are bypassing the high street travel agents and booking their holidays themselves on the Internet. Airlines have been keen to encourage this direct approach as it keeps down their costs. And increasingly, high street travel agents are finding their businesses disappearing. These days, there may be more tourists to go around, but there is also more competition among destinations. As cities, countries, and continents all compete for tourist revenue. But becoming a tourist destination is not quite as straightforward as it may seem. For example, Ireland used to sell itself as a place to enjoy the beautiful countryside. However, it soon discovered that it was attracting young student backpackers without any money. So how did Ireland set about increasing revenue from tourism? Well, the Irish Tourist Board came up with the idea of promoting the country's literature using the names of writers such as Oscar Wilde and James Joyce to appeal to older, richer tourists who would spend their money in the hotels and restaurants of the country. However, there are other ways of appealing to tourists. The U.S. is dotted with places that claim to be the capital of something or other, sometimes things which may seem rather strange. Crystal City, for example, is the world capital of the vegetable broccoli. And then there's Gilroy, famous for its garlic. These towns are trading on a single gimmick to attract the tourists. Festivals are another way to bring them in. Literary, food, art. They're all staged for one reason only, to attract tourist revenue. Many a town has sought to copy the success of Stratford, Ontario which was transformed from a small, run-down, blue-collar town to a bustling cultural center by the efforts of Tom Patterson, who managed to persuade a British director to stage their first drama festival in 1953. But then, boosting a city through tourism is nothing new. In 18th century England, bath spa became fashionable after the owners of the hot baths employed Beau Nash the trendsetter of his day, to promote the city. I want to end the lecture there for today. Thank you. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.